Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne again. We are in chapter 5 of the auto text. We're taking a look at language development and we're thinking about uh, infants and toddlers and what can we do to build up those language and literacy skills. Um, I know that many of us have uh, other children in our classroom than infants or toddlers, but I think it's very important for us to understand where do they come from. Developmentally, what are we starting with and then what's the next step? Where do we go from there? So the summary for chapter five that I try to tease out, and they expand upon this in chapter five, but basically uh, as the instructor, as the teacher, there's a variety of interactions and techniques, um, you know, different structures that you could use in your classroom to help uh, facilitate language development. So you should have a toolkit pretty much and be able to reach into that toolkit um, and figure out what works best with your students. Once again, a lot of the things that we'll see here is labeled as infants and toddlers, um, and yes, um, it's a little bit more specific for them, but I think there's opportunities to use it um, in our classroom with other students at other grade levels. Um, the Kahoot quiz we'll talk about in class, um, but basically one of the first things we want to think about is when we start with language development or literacy development in our classroom, we want to think about developmental appropriateness of the curricula, of the content that we're trying to teach. Um, and in doing so, we want to make sure that we understand developmentally where the children are coming from. Uh, we want to make sure that we integrate language and literacy, reading and writing and, and speaking throughout the curriculum. So in any content areas, if we're talking about a sixth grade math class or we're talking about a third grade uh, you know, elementary classroom, we want to make sure that we are focusing on being developmentally appropriate. We also want to make sure that we incorporate reading and writing and language, you know, and these literacy skills throughout what they do, um, not just wait for somebody else to do it in their classroom. We want to make sure that we have conceptual development. We want to make sure that we have hands-on activities that students are working with manipulatives if possible, um, and that one of these things that we've talked about throughout our time so far in class is to provide opportunities for diverse learners in our classroom, English language learners, um, bring culture into the classroom and make sure that it's um, authentic and appropriate for what we're trying to learn. Uh, in terms of interactions with infants, uh, once again, there is, uh, I would make the case that a lot of this is appropriate for, you know, infants all the way up to adults, but, uh, you know, Otto basically focus on infancy and they talk about eye contact and shared reference points, one-on-one -on -one interactions, and uh, the, the length of time and the scheduling of those interactions, um, uh, the feedback loop and the discussion pattern of observing, waiting, listening. Um, so this ties into the adult responsiveness piece that we talked about last chapter, but basically is there an opportunity to have students read, respond, talk, have someone else listen to them, preferably an adult, uh, listen and then respond back. Uh, engage in verbal mapping. Um, and then also um, one of the key components, especially with infants, is that you know they have certain physical and emotional needs uh, that need to be met. Uh, and so if there is some sort of issue or concern, if the child is upset, we wanna make sure that we quickly respond to them. That's one of those things that might change a little bit as we move into toddlerhood and then move into our grades. Um, so obviously, if you're teaching seventh grade uh, science, you know, or you have a fifth grade classroom, you don't want to immediately jump every single time one of your students gets upset and demands attention. Uh, in terms of the uh, classroom setting, uh, we need to always be cognizant of the the place uh, of the spaces and places within our classroom the the classroom setting um, you know provide opportunities and materials for social experiences have areas blocked off so students can interact and discuss with each other um, have sections set up for sensory motor activities um, periodically routinely daily depending on your classroom and your kids evaluate inspect and evaluate materials for safety um, you know in some areas especially in the sciences this is very important as a science content area teacher 
Um, and if you're using science and you're, you're teaching science in elementary school, you definitely need to pay attention to um, safety uh, of all the materials in the class and those interactions. Um, and then also think about where is that, the, where are the focal points or where is eye level in your classroom? Is it at children's level? Is it at your level? Um, you know, we've talked in several classes about, um, you know, what your room or what your building would look like to a visitor. What does it look like to your student? You know, what is the, based upon where you hang the posters in your room, the student work, how tall are the people that normally come through your room? Are you hanging it at your height or are you hanging uh, it at their height? Uh, in terms of exploratory activities, we talked last slide about sensory motor activities. Um, the rationale for this is that we want to think about conceptual uh, development. We want them to start to have cognitive develop development and think about uh, processes and, and planning out uh, larger conceptions and concepts over time. Um, talk more about monitoring to ensure safety and then think about different opportunities within a room-based system, a crib-based system, you know, if we have play on the floor, where are the mats set up, you know, do you need mats, um, is, it, is it a safe environment for, this, for the child to just lay there and play. Uh, in, in thinking of teacher-mediated activities, uh, you know, there's opportunities to interact with the adult and the child with, with singing and finger plays and uh, certain objects that you you use again and again with the child um, and activities and book sharing um, you know even in infancy there's an opportunity for students you know for children sorry to see you reading a book you know have a shorter book but show you interacting with the book and showing the child how the book operates and how you operate that text um, in terms of establishing routine terribly important um, and this is one of those things that I think you know obviously Otto talks about this with infancy and toddlerhood but I think that this is something that is a very important piece I believe uh, in, in middle school and high school it's important to have routines and I also think as adults um, you know in higher ed and then in our own lives we like to have routines um, it lets students and learners and, and individuals know what to expect um, and so there is just uh, uh, interactions within the, the classroom, interactions in the environment where we talk about physical care. We, have ha we handle sections for when feeding and changing and dressing will occur. There's a general arrival and departure time. We know what to expect and routines at least eliminate some of the stress from the daily interactions. Um, not all the stress, but some if we know what to expect. Uh, in terms of interactions with toddlers, a lot of the same things that we talked about with infants. We see certain interaction patterns, so we know that eye contact and shared reference points are once again important. Uh, communication loops, uh, so that would be the, the, the question answer response that we saw earlier with infancy. Um, we start to build up child directed speech. You know, we are talking to and expecting to hear responses back from the child. Uh, verbal mapping, once again, and then mediation. Um, you know, trying to make connections and content with students. Uh, for English language learners, we know from Otto that a lot of the same skills and strategies that we use for primary language acquisition are also necessary for second language acquisition, or SLA. Um, so when you have toddlers that are ELLs or EL students, um, once again, have eye contact, have a shared reference point with them. Um, give them a little bit extra time to wait for response. Um, you know, it, depending on the individual learners, if it, you know if they're a student with special needs um, or they're just trying to really internalize what you're teaching, you know, give them extra time for response. Um, as we saw in the in the in the video that I shared out uh, for this week, use simple syntax and vocab. You know, uh, slowly monitor your vocab and the use of your content and your the context within which you issue it uh, to help students understand and also build in gestures and interactions and, and bodily actions when you speak to provide some extra context clues um, for students as they're trying to figure out what you're what you're trying to express in terms of exploratory activities tons of opportunities um, 
you know, we have a lot of the sensory motor activities where we're building in, you know, blocks and manipulatives, we're building in a book corner, uh, writing centers, discovery centers, a drama corner, um, you know, sand water tables, art activities, out, outdoor activities. Basically what we're building in is these opportunities for different places and spaces where students understand that there's different types of learning that occur. Um, and then this is this goes along with the routines. This is letting them know that different types of learning occur in different sections and they have opportunities or, or there's expectations in those areas to act and think and work in certain ways. In terms of teachers working with students, once again, we have outdoor activities, activity boxes, song and finger plays, book sharing activities, a lot of the same things that we saw with infancy, but we're obviously um, expecting a little bit more out of the toddler. You know, we're showing them a little bit more of what's happening, maybe spending a little bit more time, have a little, have more dialogue and discussion and interaction, um, and we're focusing on meaning a little bit more than we would with uh, the infant. Uh, in the routines, once again, I think routine is very important. Uh, when we're looking at toddlers, you know, there's a general start to the day and an end to the day. There is snack time, there's meal time, and then there's you know some content and instruction embedded in between those little those time periods but at least students know where we came from and where we're going to uh, creating those connections outside of school is very important um, you know you want to quickly establish rapport with the family members we've talked in earlier chapters about how times sometimes there's a disconnect between what's happening in school and what happens at home especially in the use of language uh, you want to bring parents in right away or family members right in, uh, uh, you know, meet as soon as you can to try and establish rapport, welcome parents in the classroom, um, try and understand the role of talk in their house and the role of language in their house in that social situation. Um, and then also you, you encourage the parents to talk and dialogue and in, engage in these language development and literacy development activities with their infants and toddlers. Um, and then also encourage parents to understand and become aware of children's uh, use of gestures and how they try to express themselves. Uh, a lot of schools, a lot of teachers will have take-home activities, they'll have language and book sharing, they'll basically provide opportunities to create, you know, to use text, to use books, um, as a vehicle to get from school to home and back to create that that connection. You can have a, a lending library uh, in your classroom so you can have you know books that you include uh, that represent or try to provide a space for uh, the children's home languages. You uh, have uh, sometimes teachers will have a classroom newsletter where they talk about language development what's happening in the class and try to create better connections with what's happening at home. Uh, and so that's pretty much it for chapter five. We'll build on a lot of this in chapter six.